Welcome to the Be Rad Podcast. It's Brad Kearns. These are our sponsors. Male Optimization Formula with Organs. Brad's Macadamia Masterpiece. Perfect Keto Ketone Supplements. Carol Fit Stationary Bike. Organifi Superfood. Viore Clothing. And Let's Get Check.com Home Testing. And please visit the BradKearns.com shop page for my personal selection of favorite products for health, fitness, and peak performance with great discounts offers and now here we go with the show mofo the main concession that i will make to chronological aging is that i feel like my margin of error has tightened up a little bit margin of error for injury soreness lingering fatigue from overdoing a little bit taking much longer time to recover from high stress periods of life Dr. Kelly Starrett says for all athletes, he recommends taking 15 minutes of every training hour to work on flexibility, mobility, injury prevention, especially the extreme endurance athlete scene. The big insight I'm going to share with my diet is that trend away from kind of the basic ancestral approach with the vegetables being the main emphasis, and I no longer go looking for produce uh, to eat in the name of health. Greetings, listeners. Let's talk about some reflections and highlights over the past, say, five-year time period of health and fitness endeavors that I've been interested in trying out, succeeding with, thinking about. Uh, Of course, this breather show, as is often the case, emanates from a wonderful back-and-forth email exchange I've had with another extreme health and fitness enthusiast, my former podcast guest and lifelong friend, Dave Coburn, who is now 59 years old, but he's only 47 with his pheno age. And you too can find out how young you are or old relative to your chronological age at this website that he recommends called phenoage.com. I haven't tried it myself. I did try my wonderful inside tracker program that puts together all kinds of blood testing, DNA, and fitness tracking. I'm going to tell you much more about that uh, in the future as time goes on, but it's great to be in partnership with those guys. And they did a little quick calculation of my biological age, and it came out to 62. What? (laughs) Uh, Here that I'm turning 56 in a week, uh, 62 wasn't a nice number to see on the screen. I think they didn't like certain aspects of my blood results. Interestingly, uh, one of them is this low white count, which has been something I've had my entire life and also on my mom's blood results. So I'm going to assume that's genetic. I don't think there's a big problem there. I don't think they liked that my free testosterone was near the lower end of the range, even though my serum testosterone is routinely at the very highest 95th percentile of the range or upwards of around there, sometimes not quite that high, but I've had a lot of good results with the the serum testosterone, free T uh, on the lower end of the range, and sex hormone binding globulin outside of the maximum range by quite a bit. And we're going to talk about more uh, as we go down that road. I'm doing a lot of research and writing a book about testosterone optimization the natural way because there's not much out there about it. It's mostly about how to do drug therapy correctly. Uh, But there's so many things you can do with lifestyle to optimize testosterone. And us in the ancestral community have some insights from experts that we're uh, counting on, relying upon, uh, claiming that the sex hormone binding globulin value will be elevated due to a low carbohydrate, low insulin producing diet. And there's actually many positive aspects of having a high SHBG value, but correspondingly low free testosterone Uh, nothing to concern yourself about, which is the uh, uh, quite an opposite opinion of what uh, an MD might share if he was looking at your results. Uh, So I'm also noticing with all the research that there's so much uncertainty and confusion with blood test results for testosterone that you really are obligated to uh, throw in many of the subjective markers and evaluations such as fitness testing uh, body fat levels, uh, report, self-reported, uh, satisfaction with libido, energy, 
cognitive function, motivation, all the things that testosterone has an influence over. And you have to weigh those carefully with your blood tests uh, to get a big picture evaluation. Dr. Sean Baker, carnivore leader, former podcast guest, an extreme human fitness freak at age, oh, he's just about my age. He's 53 or 54, breaking world records on the Concept2 ergometer in these sprint events where he's busting out a 500 meter sprint in a minute 15 or somewhere around there. So at the highest level of explosive output at the world level, uh, breaking the world records in his age group and one of the top guys overall for any age at this extremely high performance explosive event of doing the rowing machine that's calibrated. You can find one in most gyms across the world and know right where you stand with the very best guys. Anyway, Sean Baker had a great article on his website where he was talking about his uh, quite low testosterone readings, both in total testosterone as well as free testosterone at the bottom end of the range where he'd be called uh, hypogonadic and would be prescribed medication. Uh, But of course, he feels great. He's filled with muscle. He performs these incredible athletic feats, works out very hard. You can check him out on Instagram. He's got some great content there. Uh, But he talks about how having a greater androgen receptor density uh, can allow you to thrive on much less, much lower levels of testosterone than might be necessary if you didn't have this attribute of androgen receptor density. And how do you develop androgen receptor density? Uh, By doing strength training. Also, fasting has a great benefit. And so these are the receptor sites on your cells that uptake the, the hormone that's transported through your bloodstream and then exerting its androgenic effects on the the cells. In other words, uh, building muscle. Uh, The androgen receptors are particularly dense in the lower extremities. So if you do a lot of full body functional lower body exercises, squats, leg presses, deadlifts, things like that, of course, sports activity, you're going to increase androgen receptor density. And then you dutifully go about your fasting protocols where you're skipping meals, spending good periods of time in a fasted state, Uh, building that androgen receptor density, making your uh, receptors more sensitive to the signaling uh, when it uh, has some testosterone passing through the bloodstream. And it says, hey, come on in. Let's uh, let's come right in quickly. I'm going to open the door for you and welcome you in. Uh, If you have good androgen receptor density, then you don't need high blood levels. And here's Sean Baker uh, publishing his results from blood labs and showing that he's uh, technically a low T guy, and then uh, joining with pictures of him uh, hoisting massive amounts of weight. So that is a huge uh, vote for weighing the subjective factors more so than just blood values. There's just no other way you can say it. You have to conclude that we're going to have to do some real world evaluation along with whatever's on the blood report. Okay, so that was a little detour into testosterone optimization. But really, when we're talking about my health and fitness reflections and highlights over the past five years, oh my gosh, that could be the overarching goal is to uh, preserve that male hormone optimization and feel uh, energetic, motivated, happy, healthy, vibrant, vital, and maintaining that edge, that passion and competitive intensity throughout life. Uh, So I have to say that going back 2017, that's now five years ago, I feel a lot better these days, even with the aging process in full swing, chronologically speaking. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that because I have to give some concessions to the calendar. And that might be interesting to hear some of those reflections. But in a general sense, uh, I reflect back to 2017 when uh, Mark Sisson and I were working on the Keto Reset Diet, which was one of the first books written about the ketogenic diet and cutting those carbs even further to stimulate these wonderful benefits of ketone production in the liver and your brain's going to be burning this high octane fuel and everything's going to be fantastic. Of course, you're going to lose weight, feel better. And here we are five years later, keto has become an absolute sensation, the latest, greatest fad diet. It has helped so many people correct health issues, get that excess body fat off and all around been a huge win, especially in comparison to, oh my gosh, think about uh, 12 years ago when Mark and I started with uh, the first book, The Primal Blueprint, and it was the most incredible uphill battle. I mean, 
not only we couldn't get uh, major New York publishers interested in anything related to this primal idea, this ancestral health approach, uh, we also had a hard time even hiring a PR agent. <laughs> we're like, yeah, well, the guy's not a doctor. It's not going to sell. It's not going to go anywhere. And it's really been wonderful to see the ancestral health movement grow like crazy in the last 12 years to where now it's a generally accepted part of society and even mainstream health authorities. We get emails and uh, commentary from uh, MDs, physicians that are deep into the uh, traditional uh, medical protocol, but have discovered on their own, basically, the benefits of uh, ancestral style eating patterns and the other reflections that have come to the forefront. Uh, during the last 12 years. Uh, so keto has come a long way as well. When we started it, no one knew anything about it. We were having to uh, interview some of these uh, early scientists and uh, learn from them. <laughs> Since we had to get our learning curve going too. guys like Dr. Finney and Dr. Volick, uh, Dom D'Agostino doing his great research over there in Florida. But for me, jumping into it, I reflect that I was kind of uh, struggling for a while with that extreme limitation of carb intake. I don't think I was properly prepared. Now we know that some of the uh, check boxes were uh, a little uh, deficient. Uh, possibly my sodium and electrolyte intake was one of the reasons that I was uh, reflecting and feeling some uh, ups and down periods and some drag ass periods, uh, particularly the practice of extensive fasting and maintaining ketogenic macronutrient standards uh, while I was also trying to uh, perform these explosive high intensity workouts and actually perform them in a manner that was overly stressful. And that's going to be one of my checkpoints that I've uh, really tried to uh, dial back these workouts that are really fun and pump you up and jack you up and make you feel great at the time, but they're too strenuous and take too long to recover from. And when you throw in a newly minted ketogenic diet person who's being really strict and disciplined and pricking my finger many times a day, all in the name of research for the book, uh, it could be too many stress factors piled up. Now, I'm still uh, reflecting back on 2017 and my training log and having these uh, crash and burn periods where I'd feel really lousy for a few days uh, in the aftermath of these intense workouts. And I'm going to chalk it up to too many stress factors piled on at once. Oh, gee, also I was having some, uh, you know, personal difficulties at that time going through a divorce. That's always stressful, even though everything was uh, peaceful and a nice smooth path, relatively speaking. It's still there and you can't really ignore that um, life is stressful sometimes. Here we are in 2020, 2021. Um, you know, it's a lot of extra stress has been added due to the alterations in uh, general society with the quarantine and the pandemic and the changing of the economy accordingly. Hopefully, what we do is we take what's uh, offered to us and do the very best we can, try not to complain, try to stay positive. And I certainly that's what I tried to do uh, back then and get through it and keep the smile on my face, but also face things directly, as I talked about in a previous show where I'm trying to be more honest and direct in all areas of life, especially on the podcast. Okay, so going from age 51 to now 56, uh, some observations are taking hold. And I think the main concession that I will make to chronological aging is that I feel like my margin of error has uh, tightened up a little bit. Margin of error for injury, uh, soreness, uh, uh, lingering fatigue from overdoing a little bit, uh, taking much longer time to recover from high stress periods of life. And that uh, particularly goes for workouts, but also possibly anything else like having a lousy night of sleep or um, jet lag all that kind of stuff. Feel like I'm a little more fragile no matter how I, how much I try to talk myself out of it. And especially the uh, margin of error for injuries and, and getting these niggling aches and pains. I'm here recording this at the six month mark of this minor knee injury that won't freaking go away. And I can assert that back when I was a, a triathlete in my twenties and issues would come about, like I'd injure my shoulder, my lower back or a running injury in my legs. And I'd put these things away in a couple of weeks 
maybe at the very most, the worst injuries I had would, you know, linger along for six weeks and I'd be so frustrated with a six week injury. So here we go with a six month injury uh, in the uh, 55 and over age division. So that's a little frustrating. And it really points to the tremendous importance of doing your homework and doing your preparations before you try to go out there and perform magnificent athletic feats with your body. So I've talked so much on the show about my morning routine and how precious that is, the flexibility, mobility, core strengthening, leg strengthening routine that I do every single day. I intend to do it for the rest of my life. And I keep adding and increasing the degree of difficulty to the extent that now it's basically a pretty darn uh, substantial workout lasting a minimum of 35 minutes. Oftentimes I add more on to the end of the template morning routine. And there I go with the workout. It's always first thing in the morning. And I think that has really helped elevate the platform from which I launch all formal workouts and play endeavors from so that I can minimize my injury risk. And boy, this knee thing is finally resolving. I'm so happy to report that. And I kept thinking over the past few months, if I could just solve this little nagging issue here, I think I'm going to emerge from this thing uh, fitter and stronger and more resilient than ever. I feel like my body's in really great shape, <laughs> except for this injury that's prevented me from doing my uh, jumping and sprinting workouts, my template workout that I was enjoying so much before uh, before this thing kicked into gear. And I want to put in a, a plug here for the world of physical therapy. And when in doubt, go to physical therapy because I delayed that a little bit. I wasn't sure how they could help me because this felt really like a joint injury. So I was heading down the path of uh, orthopedic exams. I was scheduled for the MRI. I was about to pop for my copay of 1200 bucks or whatever it was. And I finally got the appointment in. And these guys, uh, right away, uh, both of them, uh, Rod Shorey, Woodland Hills Physical Therapy in Los Angeles, and also uh, Jason Collin at PT Revolution in Lake Tahoe said, oh, you know what? There's nothing wrong with your knee, man. It's all about muscle imbalances, muscle tightness, and we need to work through these things. You really knotted yourself up. I had a big fat F grade on this simple flexion test where how could I, how, how many degrees could I comfortably internally rotate uh, my leg lying on my back with my knee bent? And oh my gosh. As soon as I got some good hands-on work and diligently uh, proceeded through the extra stretching uh, prescribed for the, the issue I had, oh my gosh, it was like immediate, a massive improvement from a lingering condition of six months that I was this close to getting an MRI. And who knows, maybe the MRI wasn't going to come out perfectly and they'd say, yeah, let's go in there and explore and scope it out or whatever they do to people uh, under the knife. And I, I shudder at the thought of how many athletes are out there that have had unnecessary uh, surgeries or unnecessary layoffs. And when you need surgery, you need surgery. I know that. Uh, but just the layoffs and the uh, going about the issue uh, without addressing the cause, buying a, a bigger and bigger brace or whatever it was. And here I was, you know, really frustrated and at my wits end because it seems like that's a long time to uh, to have a, a lingering minor knee injury. I was watching the NFL playoff game. They're talking about the lineman who's back after missing uh, so many games from week eight with major reconstructive surgery on his ACL. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second, week eight, that was only, you know, I, I think the guy was back on the field after 11 weeks or nine weeks or something like that. And I'm thinking, here I am six months with much less of an injury than this dude. So something doesn't uh, match, doesn't something's not right with this picture here. Uh, so I'm nice, uh, happy to report that the morning routine and all the flexibility, mobility, strengthening drills, absolutely essential at the older age groups. And those concessions uh, from chronological aging is just uh, less, less margin of error and uh, longer, longer time frames. Okay. Oh, gosh. I mean, it is nice. Enjoy your youth, listeners, if you're in those different age groups. I remember in my 30s and even my 40s, I could just bust out to the youth soccer practice that I was coaching and get right in there and do full sprints and stop and start and make cuts and score the winning goal in the scrimmage. <laughs> or if I was coaching high jump and there was a break in the action between groups or whatever, I'd just take a few leaps like it was nothing. Uh, I even have a video on YouTube, barefoot high jump five feet, where I, I was just filming myself to check my form. But I remember this day where I had an opportunity to to practice. And boy, when you're a high jumper and you can find some open pits, you got to take 
advantage of the situation because you never know when you're going to get access to a facility. Uh, but I'd forgotten my shoes. I was just, you know, not prepared for it. And, um, I went out there and said, what the heck? I'll do it anyway. I can't imagine, uh, high jumping barefoot now because of the load on the foot from taking off. Uh, but there I am clearing the, the same height that was my, my best height of the year at age 55. Good thing in the master's track rankings that the, the law of attrition is definitely in play. So I think that just being able to, to bend <laughs> and approach the bar. And now that I've learned, uh, stay injury free is probably the huge performance factors in the master's track division is just getting on that track healthy and then seeing what you got. So I think with the, uh, older age groups, the big concession is that you kind of tone down these uh, crazy spontaneous efforts that you're not well prepared for and then be more consistent with the uh, the injury prevention, the rehab. Dr. Kelly Starrett says for all athletes, he recommends taking 15 minutes of every training hour to work on flexibility, mobility, injury prevention, uh, especially the extreme endurance athlete scene with the, uh, the, the triathletes, the uh, the ultra distance runners and the CrossFit people that he serves so well that you got to put that time in and you think you can bypass that when you're young and you're right, but boy, you're going to pay the price later. So that's the big one here is that just putting in that baseline conditioning and not going crazy and not doing stuff that could uh, bring it increased risk of injury. So back to Dave Cobrine. I told you how our emails got this whole show going. And he's uh, age 47 uh, on the Fino age at age 59. So let's find out quickly uh, what he's been doing to keep in shape. Go back and listen to the show. It's one of the early shows on the on the podcast channel. And his incredible morning routine that sets the tone for a healthy, long, active, energetic life. Um, yes, it does take quite some time when he describes it, but of course you can pick and choose things that could work for you. Uh, but some of my favorite elements of it are, uh, the devotion to cold plunging. Um, he's so big time with that and he's the one that got me into it. So, uh, he's still going strong with his chest freezer and also in the winter time, since he lives in Newport beach, he has the luxury of going out into the Pacific ocean every morning for a cold plunge seven days a week. But the first thing he does is wake up right around sunrise and just gently jog down the beach for uh, 20, 30 minutes. And that really sets the tone for uh, not only his fitness, but a nice uh, relaxing day. And so that's the starting point. And so many times uh, he's going to back that up with some impressive workouts in the gym. He works out with weights uh, four days a week really consistent, going 45 to 60 minutes, doing some hard stuff. And this is what enabled him to do an extraordinary feat of endurance on his 59th birthday, where he did the legendary CrossFit workout called the Double Murph. The Murph is one of the template CrossFit workouts. He did it back to back. I guess it's a special occasion that CrossFit people do uh, maybe once a year. Uh, in the extraordinary time of an hour and 18 minutes, uh, beating out all a, an entire group of Division One varsity athletes of whom he is related to. And I don't want to uh, punish the, and humiliate these guys too much, but the old time dad kicked ass on the Division One varsity athletes who attempted the Murph uh, along with him and put up their time. And so here's what a Murph is. You run a mile, you do a hundred pull-ups. Of course, you need to accumulate those in sets, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. So, you know, if you can do 15 at a time or 20 and then you rest and then you get up on the bar and do another 20 and the clock is ticking, man. So you better be in darn good shape to pull off a hundred. I'm not sure I could do a hundred in a day. I know I, wait a second. Yeah, I've done a hundred in a day a, a couple times in my life. I was pretty sore the next day and that was over a period of hours. <laughs> but anyway, the clock's running. You run that mile, you come into the gym, you do a hundred pull-ups and then you commence 200 push-ups after you're finished with the 100 pull-ups, followed by 300 squats, and then you take off and run the mile again. So it's one mile, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, another mile, and then for the double Murph, you repeat the whole sequence. So you're going a total of four miles, 600 squats, 400 push-ups, and 200 pull-ups. And Dave did all that at age 59 in an hour 18. That's that's right up there as impressive as his brothers who are the ultra endurance kings of the planet still going strong for so many years 
um, brother Eric ran the Boston Marathon, uh, I believe, 25 years in a row. And Dr. Stephen, uh, who's also been mentioned many times on the podcast, uh, also did his own solo Boston Marathon exercise on the day that the, the Boston Marathon people were uh, uh, communing all over the world to run the 26 miles. And boy, Dr. Stephen, in his 50s, same age as me, high school teammate, still putting in 100-mile weeks on occasion when he has these running vacations. I can't even imagine it. It's phenomenal. And I will have some comments about that because I think uh, as we get older, some of this endurance stuff that is so popular, like the Ironman and the marathon, uh, can very easily be misaligned with health and compromise your health when it gets into uh, the chronic nature of the training, which is so common uh, among those enthusiasts. Now, uh, a long-time expert like Dr. Stephen is very careful to monitor correct heart rates. Uh, I really like how when he has even the slightest minor injury, he will hold off until the injury corrects itself so he doesn't go down these uh, these deep, dark holes of uh, overuse injuries that take a long time to recover from. So if his hamstring's off, uh, he'll be want to uh, not run for whatever it takes. Well, I think he was out there for um, six or seven weeks with a bad hamstring injury, but he never tempts it. And so he was my... Uh, my guide with my, my knee condition, he said, yeah, wait till, you know, the pain's gone and then wait another one or two weeks before resuming with, you know, once the pain's gone, don't go right out there. Just make sure, make sure, make sure and be patient. And that's how you uh, stack up a really nice, long, healthy uh, career in something that's as difficult as long distance running as a sport. So, uh, so just finishing up with some of Dave's comments about his winning health regimen, extremely into diet, extremely into self-quantification and experimenting. We've both been fascinated by this recent uh, emergence of the carnivore diet. And Dave did a strict experiment a couple of years back where he went carnivore for 30 days straight and did all the blood testing and was uh, feeling great, uh, lost some body fat that he didn't know he even had to lose. Uh, but he did have a drop in his uh, serum testosterone levels, most likely due to the uh, reduced carbohydrate intake, reduced insulin production, and probably wasn't a bad thing for him, but it was a little alarming to have your testosterone cut in half. And again, when he's burning that many calories, doing a heavy weight workout four days a week, doing sprints one day a week, maybe a little more frequently than that, out, out there on the beach, a great sprint workout, doing that cardio every single day, uh, also stretching and uh, enjoying the, the cold plunge in the sauna. So a very active, healthy guy, uh, certainly uh, not needing desperately to cut the carb intake for any reason, uh, especially body composition, blood work, and all that. So he's not eating any processed food or any um, gratuitous carbs. Uh, but still getting uh, some good intake of vegetables, lots of eggs, going really well for the superfoods, salmon, sardines, cod, and oysters, some of the healthiest foods on the planet. Nice grass-fed steak from Butcher Box. He got me into that program too when I was at his house looking at all this great stuff that was shipped there. Uh, <laughs> what's this? You want me to unpack it? Yeah, sure. You want me to eat it? Oh, sure. And then uh, for that incidental carb intake or that increased carb intake, uh, things like Greek yogurt, blueberries and fresh fruit. Uh, of course, Brad's macadamia masterpiece uh, with 80% or higher dark chocolate and all those foods. I wouldn't call them high carb foods, but if you put them together, you're going to get a sufficient amount of carbs. And he's interestingly been experimenting. Uh, of course, we're both listening to Dr. Paul Saladino and Saladino is talking about now how honey is a big part of his diet after his 18 months of completely uh, meat eating only. And uh, Dave's been trying to have some extra honey at night. And with the uh, the sleep uh, trackers that he uses, he's gone from 80% to 84% sleep efficiency. So that's something that maybe a lot of athletes might want to consider is just making sure that you uh, restock glycogen every day and go easy on your body when you're working that hard and working the muscles that hard, making sure that you're getting well nourished. Because when we're in this... Um, uh, low carbohydrate intake, low insulin production eating pattern. Uh, one thing that happens is that the appetite is really neutralized. And so you're not hungry, uh, but you might still have some rationale to go looking for some calories in support of peak performance, 
fast recovery and increased nutrient density in the diet for someone who has high nutritional needs as a high performing athlete. So my reflections, I'm going to categorize them uh, starting with diet and uh, just move right over into that topic since we've been talking about Dave's diet. And as you know, I've been deep into this game for the past 12 years, starting with working on the Primal Blueprint and uh, ditching all grains out of my diet, cold turkey at Mark Sisson's uh, direction when we started working on the project. And boy, um, there's not, you, you think there's not further optimization to be had, but I'm always interested in the subject and willing and open to uh, explore new things, new ideas, be open-minded, think critically. And I guess the most uh, interesting uh, element to note in recent times is this uh, trend toward an animal-based superfoods diet, uh, the carnivore nose-to-tail strategy, uh, but not strictly because of the aforementioned uh, comments about being an athlete. And then in my case and in Dave's case also, you know, we're uh, trying to perform these uh, high-intensity workouts and recover and be in the higher age group. So you have some stress factors at place here where you're trying to do crazy stuff that a uh, high school or college varsity athlete might be doing. And so the idea of deliberately restricting carbohydrates, especially in opposition to your appetite, is just not happening. So I'm a carnivore-ish pattern right now, but the amazing and I think permanent uh, transformations in my dietary habits that I think will stick with me for forever uh, or that I'm really emphasizing the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet in the interest of having the healthiest possible diet. So if you think about however many calories you're going to eat in a day, and if a lot of those are taken up by the oats in your oatmeal and the pasta on your plate of pasta or the bread that's uh, holding your sandwich together, you're going to reduce the nutrient density of your diet because this grain-based diet is, by definition, these foods have vastly uh, inferior nutrient profiles to the, the animal-based foods and superfoods. Uh, I published something called the Carnivore Scores Chart, and you can see that uh, on bradkearns.com. Uh, you can find it when you subscribe to the newsletter uh, at bradkearns.com. And I'd love for you to take a look at that carnivore scores. I'll make sure that we can uh, do a Google search and you can pull right down that PDF or just email us if you have trouble finding it. But you can print this out. You can put it on your refrigerator. And it's basically a ranking system of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, uh, tier one, tier two, and going down. Uh, I worked really hard on this with Kate Kretzinger. She's a primal health coach and podcast guest. And it was her idea. So she was the brainchild. She was using this uh, a modified version with her clients. And we really took it all the way to the finish line. We have a whole group of the uh, least offensive plant foods, the ones that have the least uh, toxins, anti-nutrient concerns, and the most nutrition. And you'll get a really nice overview of the things you should emphasize. There's something in the middle of the page called the steak line. <laughs> so you want to eat foods above the steak line. Uh, starting with steak, but rank above steak are things like shellfish, things like organ meats, things like oysters, uh, salmon eggs, the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, pasture-raised eggs. And then below the steak line are things like chicken and pork, because they, these meats, especially the way they're uh, grown and harvested these days, unless you get the very best uh, pasture-raised local animals, they're inferior nutrient profile to red meat. And so you hear red meat uh, demonized still in mainstream commentary. The average person off the street is saying, yeah, I'm trying to eat healthier in 2021. So uh, I'm, I'm mostly eating chicken and fish and uh, not so much red meat. Oh, congratulations. Well, guess what? You got that backwards trip out on that. Go look at the carnivore scores chart. So that's the big insight I'm going to share with my diet is that trend away from kind of the basic uh, ancestral approach uh, with the vegetables being the main emphasis. And I no longer go looking for produce uh, to eat in the name of health. I haven't had a salad in almost two years now after getting my mind blown by Ben Greenfield and Dr. Paul Saladino in that epic uh, original recording where I really got deep into uh, the carnivore eating strategy and the rationale for putting these plants on the sideline, especially for people who are sensitive uh, with things like autoimmune or inflammatory conditions that are nagging and that won't resolve with a traditional approach. So um, not that I'm one of those people, but I just started thinking about it and looking down on that steamed broccoli or that huge plate of uh, steamed vegetables that I was 
famous for uh, stir frying together and serving it to large groups. And boy, um, to think that you're not really needing the nutrition in there because you're getting so much more nutrition from the animal foods and that it quite possibly could be harming you has been the most amazing revelation. And I will say that my digestion and elimination patterns have become vastly improved since I switched to a uh, nose to tail carnivore-ish emphasis of the diet. Uh, no longer, you know, having complaints, leaky pipes in association with uh, doing uh, long workouts or, or high intensity workouts, something that I've dealt with my whole life and always attributed it to uh, the stress of the workout on my digestive tract, especially if it's running or high impact. But really, it was the uh, irritation of these foods that are uh, very difficult to digest. And that's not really in dispute. Everyone knows this, but it's all a matter of uh, rolling the dice and seeing how much you suffer from these foods that have been in your diet for your entire life and unknowingly suffer until you eliminate them and do some experimentation. So no more stir fry, no more salads. <laughs> Even Sisson, the king of the big ass salad, is now admitted on tape in public that he doesn't really have that as his dietary daily centerpiece anymore. He's more likely to go consume a steak than a salad. Trip out on that. Luckily, Primal Kitchen makes wonderful steak sauces, several different flavors. So he's in line with his brand still. Uh, the other thing I'll say on diet before we move on uh, are these interesting insights I got in my recent podcast interview with Rob Wolf, author of Paleo Solution, Wired to Eat, one of the great leaders and old timers, the founding fathers of the primal paleo movement. And he was talking about these uh, ideas that we've mentioned previously and talking about Dave, where if you have a good fitness level, good body composition, good blood work, and you want to pursue longevity and enjoying your life, he said, if you want to live a long life, lift more weights and eat more protein. Yeah, how's that for a one-liner, drop the mic, wow, wow, wee wow. And digging further, interestingly, when you're fasting, um, you're spiking the same adaptive hormones that spike during a workout. Uh, human growth hormone, testosterone, cortisol, things that make you feel great while you're fasting. But if you're also uh, training hard and you don't have a desperate need to reduce excess body fat, because that's a whole different conversation, uh, the most sure and direct path to that is to uh, eat less frequently, uh, get rid of processed foods, and get really good at fasting, right? Uh, cut carb intake is also a, a, an integral strategy there. So if that's not the case, and we're looking for longevity uh, peak performance, Rob makes an excellent case that maybe the rationale for aggressive fasting is just not there and it could be overkill and unnecessary. And he was really hitting home with me because um, I'm kind of a crash and burn guy. I always have been, especially uh, back when I was an athlete and I'd feel great and then I'd feel terrible and then I'd feel great. And I had a hard time hanging on to the consistent patterns that a lot of my fellow competitors had no problem with doing. So I was kind of a sensitive person to uh, elevated patterns of uh, recurring stress from the hard training. And so if I'm trying to stack uh, fasting for the name of health and doing the workouts, that could be a uh, second guest. And even if I don't have the appetite, and Rob got into this a little bit more on the show, even if you don't have the appetite, it might be a strategy to wake up and get some good nutrition into your body. Thinking back to the three Tommy Wood shows, some of the greatest um, uh, overall uh, jump in and learn about healthy ancestral living shows you can get. So if you want to integrate uh, a friend or family member, send them over to those Tommy Wood shows that published on the channel uh, a long time ago, a year and a half, maybe more. Uh, he One thing he said that he counsels his athletes is to eat as much healthy food as you possibly can until you add a pound of fat and then dial it back. And so he wants his athletes eating getting that good nutrition. And boy, if you uh, overdo it with the fasting and try to pump out those great workouts, it's a very common uh, condition in the uh, CrossFit community. You can get into the burnout phase. And that's when you start slowing down, you start feeling lousy, you start to preserve body fat and strip lean muscle tissue, all these compensatory mechanisms to uh, a routine that's too stressful. So that's part one, my reflections on five years health and fitness protocols, strategies, 
And we talked a lot about um, the effects of chronological aging, the necessary adjustments, and then into the diet scene and the transition that I've made in recent years. Hope you enjoyed it. But part two is going to be awesome because we're going to get into exercise, the latest, greatest, uh, things like cold plunging, and then some of the mindset and lifestyle attributes that have really worked for me that I've really uh, appreciated uh, a lot of this stuff coming from podcast guests. So hope you listen to part two of this breather five-year reflection. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.